The most basic job of any storyteller is to keep their audience guessing what will happen next. That's what we're going to talk about today, and I've got four techniques that will help keep your audience glued to your stories. By the way, my name is Brandon McNulty, and I've got some exciting news. I'll be releasing a new book at the end of this month. It's called The Half Murders, and I've been pitching it as Jekyll and Hyde meets The Haunting of Hill House. And if you're interested in learning more, I will link to it in the description below. But for now, I'm going to talk about another book, one I've been reading. It's called Screenwriting the Sequence Approach. And this book focuses on the idea of the eight sequences, which is a structural method for thinking of your stories. Basically, if you're someone who doesn't like three-act structure, maybe you think it's too broad or it doesn't fill in enough blanks, you might want to test out the idea of the eight sequences. And essentially what this does, it breaks down a story into eight different parts. Sometimes this can help you really narrow things down and get more specific with it. I'm hoping to do a video on the eight sequences in the near future, but today what I'm going to discuss are these four four tools or techniques that are discussed in the opening chapter of this book. And these, these techniques are used for keeping your audience engaged, keeping them thinking about what will happen next in your story. Now, some of these techniques are ones that we naturally use while telling our stories. Others we might be less familiar with, or we might just not use them as much. But I think they're all valuable, and that's why I'm going to go through each of them today. I'm going to explain what they are, how they break down, and I'll give you some examples of each. The first technique is called telegraphing. And this is when you tell the audience explicitly what will happen in the future of a story. Oftentimes, this is done through dialogue. For instance, in an episode of Seinfeld, you might hear Jerry say something like, oh, I'm going to meet George at the coffee shop. And then in the next scene, he's sitting there with George at the coffee shop. So it's telegraphing what is going to happen in the future of the story. Now, instead of using dialogue, you might use visual cues in order to signal to the audience what will happen in the future. For instance, maybe you have a story where a family is packing up their car and they're loading up all sorts of clothes and maybe surfboards and things like that. And that would signal that the family is about to go on vacation. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that just because you're telegraphing something in your story doesn't mean that that story has to be predictable, doesn't mean that we have to get that particular outcome, because this can work in reverse as well. So, for instance, if you have a character, maybe she's getting into her wedding dress, she's prepared to go to a wedding, and then along the way, instead of going to that wedding, maybe she gets abducted by aliens or captured by terrorists or something, and then that can blow up your audience's expectations. And one final thing I want to throw out there is that telegraphing is a great way to create suspense in your stories, whether it's in the short term or the long term. And the TV series 24 did a great job with this. There were always scenarios where they would say things like, oh, well, the bomb is going to go off at 9 o'clock. And that could keep the audience engaged, keep them wondering about what will happen when that time comes. Second technique is what's called a dangling cause. And we all know that stories are built upon the idea of cause and effect. Something happens which prompts something else to happen. And for a basic example of this, we'll say that we have a scenario where a man walks up to a woman and asks her out on a date. That would be a cause. And the effect would be her reply, whether it's a yes or a no. Now, it's important to keep in mind here that in this particular scenario, the effect is immediate. It happens right after the cause. Now, on the other hand, for this technique of the dangling cause to work, you would need to give us the cause and then hold off on giving us the effect. In other words, make sure that there are some events happening between the cause and the effect. Make us wait for that effect. And what this will do, it'll put questions in your audience's head. It'll keep them thinking about what is going to happen down the line. It'll keep them invested in those potential outcomes. Now, now, going back to that simple example I gave you where the man asks out the woman, you can have that effect come later on if you just switch the scenario up a little bit. For instance, instead of having him walk up to the woman and ask her on a date, have him send her a text message, then the effect doesn't have to be immediate. There could be a period between the cause and effect where other events occur and then we get the answer later. And if you're looking for inspiration here, you might consider things like an expression of intent, a warning, a threat, an expression of hope or fear or a prediction. And one great example from Game of Thrones comes from the early seasons when Stannis Baratheon puts a curse on some of his biggest rivals. He burns the leeches, and it's supposed to curse people like Robb Stark, Theon Greyjoy, and Joffrey Baratheon, and we don't get an immediate effect out of this. We have to wait until later on in the show to see how this curse plays out. Third technique is dramatic irony. And I've talked about this on the channel before. What it is, it's when the audience knows something that the characters do not. 
not. You might have a scenario where you, you're writing a story that has multiple POV characters, and maybe in one plot line, a character is planning to hurt another, but that other character doesn't know about it, and then when we jump into their point of view, we, the audience, fear for them because they're completely innocent to the danger that is about to hit them. Now, there are two simple steps for creating dramatic irony in your stories. The first step is revelation, and this is when the audience learns a piece of information that the characters don't know about. And then the second step is recognition. This is when the characters discover the piece of information that the audience has known all along. And when that recognition hits, it can create some exciting scenarios. Another thing to keep in mind here is that typically you will use dramatic irony to create either suspense or comedic effect. With suspense, we're talking about making the audience fear for the future. And there's a great example from Raiders of the Lost Ark. In the middle of the movie, Indiana Jones is getting a special headpiece examined. And while he's there, there, one of his enemies sneaks into the building and poisons his food. We, the audience, know it's poisoned, but Indy doesn't, and that creates suspense in the scene. On the other hand, when you're using it for comedic effect, you'll use dramatic irony to create a misunderstanding that will be drawn out for laughs and intrigue. A great example of this comes from the movie You've Got Mail, and here you have a scenario where two characters fall in love with each other over email, but they don't know each other's identities in real life. However, they do eventually bump into each other by chance in real life, and they end up hating each other. So the audience knows that these two characters have the potential to be a happy couple, and the audience roots for them to get together, and in the meantime they enjoy some humorous situations until the truth is revealed. And then the fourth technique is dramatic tension. And this is critical to any story, it's what drives the story, and what it is, it's the idea that a character wants something very badly, but they're having trouble getting it. So you need a scenario like this in your story in order to drive it. And another thing to keep in mind here is that in order for dramatic tension to work, you need to create a strong emotional bond between the audience and the character. So, for instance, what you need to do early on, you need to introduce that character, you need to build a bond between the character and the audience, make us care about that character, and make the audience get invested in what the character wants. Now, when it comes to building dramatic tension in your stories, it's a three-part process. You have the question, the tension, and then the answer or the resolution. In other words, you're going to be raising a question early on, you're going to be playing out that question over the course of the story, and then toward the end, you're going to answer that question. So part one here is the dramatic question. And the question is, will the character get what they want? For example, in Star Wars, Luke wants to deliver the Death Star plans to the Rebel Alliance. The dramatic question here is, will Luke succeed in delivering those plans? Then we get the main tension. In other words, how does the character try to get what they want? What obstacles does the character face? How does the character overcome those obstacles? If we go back to our Star Wars example, Luke can't just deliver the Death Star plans because he's stuck on Tatooine. Therefore, he has to join up with Obi-Wan and Han Solo, then they try to go to Alderaan, but they get captured by the Empire, and then they set out to rescue Princess Leia, and they end up escaping together. And that leads to our answer or resolution. And the answer to a story's dramatic question does not come at the very end of the story, believe it or not. It actually comes well before then. Usually the main character will get what they want around the 75% mark of the story, and then a new question will arise as a result. So again, going back to Star Wars, Luke successfully delivers the stolen plans to the Rebel Alliance about 80-85% of the way through the story. That's the resolution to the main tension in the story. But the story isn't over just yet, because a new dramatic question has been raised, and that question is, will Luke and the Rebels destroy the Death Star before it destroys the Rebel base? And then we have our tension with the Rebels facing setbacks throughout the Death Star battle, and finally we get another answer slash resolution, and that's when Luke blows up the Empire's deadly weapon. So I hope this helps. Question of the day, what is one story that managed to keep you engaged from start to finish? Let us know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. If you want to support the channel, please pick up copies of any of my books. And once again, The Half Murders, I'll be releasing it at the end of the month. It's like Jekyll and Hyde meets The Haunting of Hill House, so if that sounds like something that's up your alley, check out the pre-order link in the description below. Also, be sure to check out my other videos, like, share, and subscribe, and as always, remember to keep on writing.